Now it's time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Rachel. Uh, so the, the eclipse did not disappoint. I watched it from New York City, and we got 90% apparently uh, eclipse. And I, I, I just, I wasn't expecting much, and then it was much. Yes, exactly. It yeah. did not disappoint. I I was in a place where it was like, I think we were like 97, so mm -hmm. I was pretty close. Yeah. And the feeling of, first of all, the birds went crazy, and then the birds went totally silent. That was weird. But then the feeling of like it being both dark and suddenly cool, you know, like feeling the temperature mm -hmm. drop was just otherworldly. It was just, I mean, I guess literally it's otherworldly. It was crazy. I just thought it was fantastic. Yeah, we had the temperature drop here, of course, but Birds aren't permitted in New York City, so <laughs> uh, we, we didn't have any uh, galloping giraffes or any of those other uh, phenomena that apparently happen around the planet under these circumstances, but it was pretty great. Yeah, it was pretty. I was waiting for my dogs to be weird, and they both mm -hmm. just slept through it. Ah, they they so. knew it was coming, yeah. They were like, oh, it's dark, bye. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of legal stuff to get to uh, tonight, Rachel. We have the jury questions for a jury that's going to start being getting impaneled one week from today. This next Monday night, we'll be talking about what happened in jury selection today in Manhattan. We also have the Jack Smith uh, brief to the Supreme Court on the immunity claim by Donald Trump. And, you know, Rachel, I got to say, uh, as legalistic as it is, it makes a lot of sense, this Jack Smith <laughs> argument that, no, the founders never said that presidents can commit any crimes they want to. And if they can commit any crimes, maybe the one they really can't commit is a coup. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even if they can't do other things, right. maybe they can't do that one, right? Yeah. yeah. I will say Jack Smith's filings never disappoint for the non-lawyers among us, including you and me. Um, it is, uh, I, I always find his filings to be very plain English, very readable, and he's straight to the point. Yeah, they're the best legal reading you, you could ask for, for a couple of reasons. The clarity, uh, the simplicity of concept that's constantly being delivered, and then the huge import of it all. Every time you read one, you know you're holding history in your hands. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well done. All right, Thank thanks, you, Rachel. Lawrence. Thank you. For Donald Trump's entire life, before becoming a politician, he was a strong, strong supporter of abortion, verging on an enthusiast. He was the kind of guy who would say, what are we going to do about this? When a woman told him he impregnated her. He told that story in 2004 on Howard Stern's radio show. Donald Trump said, you know, all the time it was like, excuse me, what happened? And I said, well, what are we going to do about this? She said, are you serious? It's the most beautiful day of our lives. I said, oh, great. And now Donald Trump's most ignored child, Tiffany Trump, has that story of her birth that lives publicly with her for her entire life, thanks to then abortion enthusiast Donald Trump. So Donald Trump has been lying about abortion every time he has spoken about it since he became a Republican candidate in 2015. He lied about it again today when he once again proudly took credit for ending abortion rights in this country. I was proudly the person responsible for the ending of something that all legal scholars, both sides, wanted and, in fact, demanded be ended. Roe v. Wade. All legal scholars on both sides is a Trumpian lie, of course. In fact, most legal scholars, like most people in the United States of America, very much wanted to preserve women's reproductive rights established in Roe versus Wade 51 years ago. Donald Trump then announced today a new position on abortion, which he was afraid to announce during the Republican presidential primaries because it could have cost him Republican votes in those primaries. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both. Donald Trump's lie there, of course, is that everybody wanted to leave abortion up to the individual states. That is a lie. 
Most Americans did not want to have different abortion laws in each state. And now Donald Trump is taking full credit for making reproductive rights impossible for one third of American women. The Washington Post reports nearly one in three women ages 15 to 44 live in a state where abortion is banned or severely restricted. Today, Donald Trump said, in effect, that he fully supports every abortion provided in the state of California, because that's California's choice. And at the same time, Donald Trump fully supports a five-year prison sentence for anyone involved in an abortion in the state of Idaho. That five-year prison term for involvement in an abortion in Idaho was upheld by three Trump-appointed federal appeals court judges. Lindsey Graham showed us today what would have happened if Donald Trump announced his leave it up to the state's policy while Republican candidates were still running against him. Senator Graham said, I respectfully disagree with President Trump's statement that abortion is a state's rights issue. I will continue to advocate that there should be a national minimum standard limiting abortion at 15 weeks. Donald Trump fired back immediately, saying, Senator Lindsey Graham is doing a great disservice to the Republican Party and to our country. At first, he wanted no abortions under any circumstances. Then he was up to six weeks where you're allowed abortion. Now he's up to 15 weeks. Lindsey Graham is considering himself lucky tonight that Donald Trump did not give out his cell phone number this time the way Donald Trump did during his first presidential campaign when he was angry at Lindsey Graham. I wrote the number down. I don't know if it's the right number. Let's try it. 202. 228. I don't know. Maybe it's, you know, it's three, four years ago, so maybe it's an old number. 202, 228. So, I don't know. Give it a shot. Trump voters gave it a shot. And Lindsey Graham had to get a new cell phone number and has spent every day of his life since then living in abject fear of Donald Trump. Donald Trump also said this in his rebuke of Lindsey Graham today. Many good Republicans lost elections because of this issue, and people like Lindsey Graham that are unrelenting are handing Democrats their dream of the House, Senate, and perhaps even the presidency. Donald Trump is right, of course, that the repeal of Roe versus Wade is one of the issues that will defeat Donald Trump in the election, especially now that Donald Trump is announcing that abortion, for him, is just a political calculation. But he is wrong to believe that he can teach ardent abortion opponents who believe that all abortion is murder that abortion is really just a political issue, that the Republican position on abortion should just be a political calculation. It should not be driven by factors like the rights of women, medical science, or morality, just politics. That is now the official Trump position on abortion rights, just a political calculation, no principles involved. The Biden-Harris campaign posted this video today about Amanda and Josh Zawoski, a Texas couple who attended this year's State of the Union address by President Biden after what they endured in Texas, thanks to Donald Trump. This is one of our willow boxes. This is just filled with some of the things that we had started gathering for her while I was pregnant. Yep. There's her little baby book. This is the outfit that she was going to maybe wear home from the hospital. All of these. Um, this is the blanket that she was in. And these are her little footprints. Okay. 
Texas Congressman Colin Allred, now a candidate for Senate in Texas, will join our discussion in a moment. President Biden released this statement today. Trump doesn't tell you the mega Republicans he controls in Congress have put forward bills that could ban fertility treatments and that the Speaker of the House he empowered is one of the strongest supporters for a national abortion ban in the nation. Let there be no illusion. If Donald Trump is elected and the mega Republicans in Congress put a national abortion ban on the resolute desk, Trump will sign it into law. I am determined to restore the federal protections of Roe versus Wade. The fundamental right to choose for women will once again be the law of the land. If you give me and Vice President Harris a Democratic Congress, that is exactly what we will do. Trump is simply lying. There was no groundswell of support in America for overturning Roe. In fact, support for Roe is higher today in America than it has ever been. The real truth is Trump made a political deal in 2016. He promised to appoint a court that would get rid of Roe, and he had to make good on that debt. So he did. It was never about public policy or what was right or what Trump believed it was always about politics. It was always about politics. And Vice President Harris said this today. If he were to be put back in a position where he could sign off on a law, he would sign off on a national abortion ban. Let's be very clear about that. And that obviously makes the contrast between Joe Biden and Donald Trump quite clear. Leading off our discussion tonight is Democratic Senator Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota. She's a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee and chair of the Senate Rules Committee. She's also running for re-election to the United States Senate in 2024. Uh, Senator Klobuchar, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Donald Trump seems thank you, she, Donald Trump seems very worried that Lindsey Graham is ruining everything. He's ruining the presidential campaign for Donald Trump ruining the Senate campaign for your opponent and for other Republican candidates. Uh, and he may very well be right about that. Well, you know, there goes loyalty to friends for Donald Trump. But I think the bigger picture, you know, the sun peeking out from the moon on this cosmic day uh, is what President Biden and Vice President Harris just said. I mean, to be clear, as President Biden has said, if the Republicans got in and controlled Congress and put that bill on the resolute desk, Donald Trump would sign it. And what really is amazing about this day and that heartbreaking ad that you just showed, Amanda's story, which has been replicated all across the country, unbelievable, might be heard from even having a baby again, which is what she wants. What is really amazing about this is you don't need a fact checker for that ad, Lawrence. That fact checker is in Donald Trump's video itself. When he says so clearly, I am proudly, those are his words, the person who has the responsibility, who is responsible for overturning Roe v. Wade. So while Donald Trump, this choice is clear, while Donald Trump overturned 50 years of legal rights for women, Joe Biden will restore it. Yeah, and the, the Trump position is that he fully supports what happened to Amanda because the Republican government of Texas has decided that should happen to Amanda in Texas. And Donald Trump is very happy for it not to happen to anyone in California or Massachusetts or New York. Right. That's the Trump position. If you live in a Republican controlled state, uh, you're going to live under this regime that can do this to people like Amanda. And what does that mean? One third of women in America live in this regime and the other ones don't. A patchwork of laws, bans on travel that some of these states have put in place, criminalizing doctors that some of them have put in place. Um, this idea that you're going to have no exception for rape or incest like we see uh, out of Texas. That is what he is basically sentencing them to after position after position, as you point out, in line with whatever politics suits his fancy. This is the moment where people are going to have to choose what side they're on. And when he says there's a groundswell of support to overturn Roe, <laughs> look at the voters turning out in the prairies of Kansas. 
turning out in Ohio by an 11-point margin in that great state where we're going to see Sherrod Brown win that election. Um, or you go over to Wisconsin, where Tammy Baldwin, great senator, look at that. 10-point margin on the Supreme Court there. You look at what's going on all over the country. The voters are speaking out loud and clear about where they are on this. And he just took responsibility for this chaos. Donald Trump took responsibility. Senator, I want to review a moment that I know none of us can forget, uh, delivered to us on this network by Chris Matthews in 2016, Donald Trump saying that, yes, of course, there has to be some punishment for women who get uh, uh, abortion services. Let's listen to this. Do you believe, no, but, in, but you're, do you you're, believe you're, in punishment for abortion? Yes or no, as a principle? Uh, the answer is that there has to be some form of punishment. For the woman? Yeah, there has to be some form. <laughs> so, Senator, he supports the five-year prison term in Idaho for anyone involved in an abortion, and he clearly would support, as he said right there, uh, any prison term you might want to impose on a woman anywhere in the country, as long as a state decides to do that. That's the Trump position. Exactly. Or maybe they're judges, right? Mepha Pristown, judge down there he put on in Texas. There we go. Um, he is basically saying, throw this to the state and we will continue this chaos. And I'm going to support, when he says throw it to the states, that means he is supporting uh, these draconian provisions that many, sadly, these governors who ran to the state house after the Dobbs decision came out and saw who could match and got the most draconian state law possible, he owns it now. He owns it. He already owns the judges. He put those Dobbs judges on the court. But now he is also going to own what these states do. He has made his position and clear. And that is when the sun came out from under the moon. And so we can now know when Amanda tells her story, this guy has claimed responsibility for it. Senator, I want to, a final point before you go, I want to go to, to your job on the Senate Judiciary Committee of confirming federal judges. Uh, the big question for voters is, who do you want sending those judges to the committee? Do you want Donald Trump sending more of the judges that he has already sent, including those three judges on the appeals court that have confirmed uh, and, uh, and have uh, affirmed the five-year penalty, criminal sentence, for involvement in abortion in Idaho, there are three Trump judges who have affirmed that at the federal appeals court level. Donald Trump in the presidency would send more of those judges to your committee. Exactly. And that is why we have confirmed 190 judges, including Katanji Brown Jackson, that Joe Biden has put before us. We have three this week from Utah and Nebraska and the great state of Michigan. Uh, we have we are moving forward on these judges. Um, and you look at why it matters. It matters. You just are going to discuss later in your program whether or not a president is above the law, um, whether or not he can claim immunity for any act, because that's what Donald Trump is claiming. Um, we know with the Mephapristone decision, uh, that was a Trump judge. These decisions about voting rights and the decisions about um, um, changing uh, the John Lewis bill and making all of these decisions, that's about judges who have been put on by Donald Trump, yes, but also it's about judges you can put on that follow the law and are highly qualified. Um, and even the Chevron decision, which you know, Lawrence, with your legal aptitude, uh, which is about allowing agencies to make decisions about, say, what is the percentage of particles in air pollution? Some of these judges that Donald Trump put on or are um, judges out of his oak, they actually have said, oh, agencies shouldn't do that. We should have Congress and the judges make those decisions. You can see where this is rolling if he is allowed to come back and put these judges on. Senator Amy Klobuchar, thank you very much for joining us tonight. It was great to be on again, Lawrence. Thank Thanks. You. And joining us now is Congressman Colin Allred, Democratic candidate for Senate in Texas this year. Uh, Congressman Allred, I, I know you, you know the story uh, told in that video uh, by Amanda, and of course she was at the, the State of the Union address. All of Texas should know that story by now. Donald Trump fully supports what happened to her because he fully supports whatever Republicans want to make as the law of Texas uh, as it relates to reproductive rights. 
Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on, Lawrence. You know, I actually just spoke with Amanda a few minutes ago uh, before coming on your show. I wanted to talk to her because she's a friend, and I wanted to let her know that we were going to be talking about her story. And I wanted to thank her for her bravery in talking about what is a deeply, deeply personal and heartbreaking story. And I hope folks around the country, when they watch Amanda's story, they hear about it, understand what's happening in Texas, what our reality is now, which is that 26,000 women in Texas have been forced to give birth to their rapist child, Lawrence, that folks like Amanda have lawyers, not doctors, determining whether or not they are sick enough to get the care that they need, that folks like Dr. Austin Denard, who is a friend of mine, uh, who grew up 10 minutes from me in Dallas, who had a much wanted third pregnancy, had to flee the state to get the care that she needed. This is not who we are as Americans, but I'll tell you what, it's also not who we are as Texans. I spent the last week plus canvassing our state, crisscrossing our state from North Texas to the Hill Country, uh, down to Laredo, uh, Houston, to Victoria, Texas, all over our state. And all over our state, Texans are talking about this. And we're gonna stand up on November 5th and vote out Ted Cruz. Uh, Donald Trump tonight is worried that Lindsey Graham highlighting Donald Trump's inconsistency on abortion policy uh, will hurt not just Donald Trump's uh, candidacy, but will also hurt uh, Senator Cruz's candidacy against you. Uh, and it seems to me that, that Donald Trump believes in the potency of this issue uh, as much as you do. Yeah. Well, they're playing politics and they're playing with people's lives. But let's ve be very clear. Ted Cruz does support a national abortion ban. Ted Cruz celebrated the Dobbs decision. And in doing so, and over the years of his extremism, uh, the, you know, the uh, anticipated outcome that you could have seen coming is exactly what we're dealing with right now. Uh, and so uh, Ted Cruz is now about to get, you know, <laughs> uh, the repercussions are gonna come to him now. Uh, he was too cowardly when Amanda spoke before the Senate Judiciary Committee to be there to hear her story. But he's going to hear her voice loud and clear in November. Well, I have to go back over this, because this, as a matter of uh, Senate tradition and procedure, is really quite shocking. When you're a member of a committee and someone from your state comes to testify, mm -hmm. I have never seen a moment where a senator wasn't just there at the committee for the person from his state to, or her state to testify, but frequently introduces that witness uh, to a committee mm -hmm. uh, when right. that witness comes from that senator's state. Senator Cruz wouldn't That's even right. attend the hearing when Amanda testified? No. That's right. He, he, I guess he couldn't face her. He couldn't hear uh, from her lips uh, you know, the outcomes of his policies and what it meant to her and to her, her family and to their future. I mean, as you said, you know, I, I'm a member of Congress. Uh, when I have somebody from you know, hometown or somebody who, from my state in front of our committee, I want to be there so they know that I'm there with them and that I want to hear from them. You know, Ted Cruz uh, wouldn't even show Amanda uh, you know, that little bit of respect. Carson Cullen Allred now running against Senator Cruz in Texas for the Senate. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Coming up, breaking news of the night, a new filing. Special Prosecutor Jack Smith is urging the Supreme Court to reject, of course, Donald Trump's claim of presidential immunity that would allow Donald Trump or any president to commit any crime they choose to commit while in office and after being in office. That's next. Breaking news of the night, Special Prosecutor Jack Smith urged the Supreme Court to reject Donald Trump's claims that Donald Trump has absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for trying to steal the 2020 presidential election. Jack Smith's brief to the Supreme Court attacks every immunity claim Donald Trump makes. Jack Smith said, the president's constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed does not entail a general right to violate them. Petitioner suggests that unless a criminal statute expressly names the president, the statute does not apply. That radical suggestion, which would free the president from virtually all criminal law, even crimes such as bribery, murder, treason, and sedition, is unfounded. Jack Smith's brief stressed that Donald Trump is the only president in history 
who believes in presidential immunity. Jack Smith wrote, the framers never endorsed criminal immunity for a former president, and all presidents from the founding to the modern era have known that after leaving office, they faced potential criminal liability for official acts. The closest historical analog is President Nixon's official conduct in Watergate, and his acceptance of a pardon implied his and President Ford's recognition that a former president was subject to prosecution. The absence of any prosecutions of former presidents until this case does not reflect the understanding that presidents are immune from criminal liability. It instead underscores the unprecedented nature of petitioners' alleged conduct. To the particulars of the case, Jack Smith wrote, first, the president's alleged criminal scheme to overturn an election and thwart the peaceful transfer of power to his lawfully elected successor is the paradigmatic example of conduct that should not be immunized, even if other conduct should be. Second, at the core of the charged conspiracies is a private scheme with private actors to achieve a private end, petitioner's effort to remain in power by fraud. Those allegations of private misconduct are more than sufficient to support the indictment. Joining our discussion now is Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney and a professor at the University of Alabama School of Law. She is co-host of the podcast Hashtag Sisters in Law and an MSNBC legal analyst. Uh, Joyce Vance, just when we think we've heard all the arguments already on this issue, uh, Jack Smith comes through with another brief with new ways of saying these things that become ever more powerful every time he's forced to restate them. I think that that's right. You know, this is a technical legal brief, and Smith is making arguments predicated on what he hopes the Supreme Court will do, ruling that there's no immunity, and what he's afraid the court might do, ruling that there's limited immunity, in which case Smith says to the court, no matter what you decide about what immunity might exist, Donald Trump isn't entitled to any immunity. You should send this case back to the district court for trial because his conduct involves a purely personal conspiracy. And although we're entitled to use evidence of his official acts, we could try this case just as a private, unofficial acts conspiracy. So it's extremely well-crafted from a technical legal point of view. The language, though, is beautiful, Lawrence, and I'm struck, despite trying to read it with my professional hat on, how emotionally this uh -huh. brief hits. This is Jack Smith saying to the Supreme Court, Please don't sacrifice the American experiment on the altar of Donald Trump. It is in, in many ways an emotional brief about what it means to be an American and to have no man be above the law in this country. And it is supported by other briefs uh, filed, including uh, by historians. This is what the historian's brief uh, filed today says. The founders' disinterest in taking up executive immunity is not surprising. The constitutional debate was framed by the Federalists, who sought to include an executive that was strong, but whose powers were not boundless, and those who were concerned that any executive would be too inherently dangerous. The Federalists retained their concern that a president must be subject to constraints on his ambition. They certainly were not advocating for increasing a, a president's privileges or immunities. The framers did not ignore the subject. They rejected it. On this point, there are no credible, competing, original understandings. Uh, and Joyce, as we know, the Republicans on the Supreme Court uh, claim that they believe uh, that original intent is what matters. They do, in fact, make that claim, and this brief is powerful on that point. This is leading historians, historians who look at and, and study what the Founding Fathers meant. And that's what the conservative majority on this court says matters to them. They've used that in other cases, including Dobbs, the abortion decision. The conclusion in this amicus brief is pretty startling. It's really across the board saying absolutely no immunity. This was not what the founding fathers meant the Constitution to mean. 
The uh, another very powerful brief fired by uh, filed by former military leaders uh, saying that the theory that the president is absolutely immune from criminal prosecution, if accepted, has the potential to severely undermine the commander in chief's legal and moral authority to lead the military forces, as it would signal that they, but not he, must obey the rule of law. Uh, Joyce, we're going to squeeze in a commercial break here uh, and come back to the jury questions that we got today that jurors will be uh, being asked exactly a week from now in Manhattan in the first Trump criminal trial. We're going to squeeze in a break right here. We'll be back with Joyce Vance right after this. Have you, a relative or a close friend, ever worked for any company or organization that is owned or run by Donald Trump or anyone in his family? That's question number 28 that you will be asked if you are in the Manhattan jury pool for Donald Trump's first criminal trial beginning one week from tonight, from today. Uh, question 29A, have you, a relative or a close friend, ever worked or volunteered for a Trump presidential campaign? the Trump presidential administration, or any other political entity affiliated with Mr. Trump? Have you ever attended a rally or a campaign event for Donald Trump? Uh, question 29E, uh, have you, a relative or a close friend, ever worked or volunteered for any anti-Trump group or organization? 29H, do you currently follow any anti-Trump group or organization on any social media site, or have you done so in the past? And question 30, have you ever considered yourself a supporter of or belong to any of the following? The QAnon movement, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, Three Percenters, Boogaloo Boys, Antifa. Uh, Joyce Vance is back with us. Uh, Joyce, this, um, this list of potential questions for uh, uh, Trump jurors has some questions that we've never seen before. You know, some of these questions are very specific to this trial, but really, Lawrence, anyone who's been involved in jury service will find these questions to be very familiar. The, the whole point of this process is to determine whether jurors will be able to set aside any knowledge that they've gained outside of the courtroom, any prejudices or beliefs or affiliations they may have, and try the case simply on the evidence that they hear in court and the law that the judge explains to them. That's the fair jury that we say that defendants are entitled to, and that's the judge's goal when he lets the lawyers and, and perhaps he himself will participate um, question potential jurors. And Joyce, uh, so what are the lawyers' options uh, when they hear these answers? They, they can challenge for cause, uh, and then some they can just... Uh, have removed from the pool without giving any reason at all. Is that right? Right. It becomes a counting game for the lawyers. You get a certain number um, of challenges, peremptory challenges, that you can use just if a juror makes you uncomfortable. You don't like the juror. Now, there are some limitations on that. You can't, for instance, exclude jurors because of their race. But by and large, that's the that's where most of the challenges to jurors come from. You can also challenge a juror for cause, a juror who says, for instance, I'm a Joe Biden supporter and I'm going to vote to convict Donald Trump no matter what the evidence is. That juror has gone for cause on that statement. Well, we will be watching on Monday to see what the challenges become. Joyce Vance, thank you very much for joining our discussions tonight. Thank you, Lawrence. Coming up, exactly six months ago, the war began between Israel and Gaza after Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th. New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning columnist Thomas Friedman will join us next. It has been six months. Exactly six months ago yesterday, Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th, killing 1,000. 139 people and taking at least 230 people hostage. One of the hostages they took is 62-year-old Aviva Siegel, whose husband Keith is still being held hostage. Speaking in Washington yesterday, she asked us to remember him. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and imagine Keith that is 64 years old begging for water, begging for something to eat, begging for some air to breathe, 
begging for just standing to move his body, begging to talk, begging to come home, to be with us. He is begging there in Gaza. Keith is still in Gaza, going through hell. I was there for 51 days. I went through hell. I was starved while the terrorists ate in front of me. I was tortured. I was threatened and I was thirsty. I had no human rights. I felt like nothing, but I came back. I returned from living hell, and I'm here standing today alive with my daughters. As I living proof that we can bring them home. In his New York Times column just before Christmas, two and a half months into the war in Gaza, our next guest, World Prize winning columnist Thomas Friedman, wrote, Israel has done enormous damage to Hamas's military infrastructure, but at a cost to innocent civilians in Gaza that cannot be morally or strategically <clears throat> justified any longer. That was 16 weeks ago. Israel has admitted responsibility for the killing of seven food aid workers last week. The Israeli military's chief spokesperson told reporters, quote, it's a tragedy, it's a serious event that we're responsible for, and it shouldn't have happened. Since President Biden's 40-minute phone call with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Thursday, Israel has approved the opening of three humanitarian aid corridors that were specifically requested by President Biden. And yesterday, <clears throat> the Israeli government said some Israeli troops are being withdrawn from southern Gaza and negotiations with Hamas for a ceasefire and release of hostages will resume. Joining our discussion now is Thomas Friedman, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for The New York Times. He is the author of From Beirut to Jerusalem. Uh, Tom, thank you very much for rejoining us here <clears throat> on the program. You warned from the beginning that a massive uh, Israeli invasion of Gaza could be a mistake. Here we are at the sixth month point. How do you assess what the situation there is tonight and where we might be going from here? Well, thanks, Lawrence. I guess the way I summarize it is that um, a war that Israel began um, out of a feeling of both moral and strategic necessity uh, has turned into a moral and strategic tragedy uh, for Israelis and Palestinians. Um, and at this stage, we there are only really three ways this war can end, Lawrence, um, in a way that is, I think, uh, decent for Israelis and decent for Palestinians. Um, the preferred option would be uh, as if Hamas military was dismantled and replaced in Gaza by the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank uh, in partnership with um, uh, armies of Arab governments like the United Arab Emirates. I think that could only happen, though, if the United States really laid down a, a far-reaching peace plan um, calling for two states for two people. That's one way this could end, uh, the best way it could end. Um, it could also end with Israel just leaving um, uh, and, and basically not attempting in any way to govern Gaza, but also not allowing the Palestinian Authority to come in either. Uh, in which case you'll have kind of Somalia on the Mediterranean, a kind of gangland Gaza. The third option would be for Israel to leave um, and leave some rump Hamas presence uh, in Gaza uh, to, to run whatever it can um, uh, in some kind of uh, way to, to keep the place basically running and humanitarian aid coming in. I'm sure that would be the, um, uh, the least best option for Israel, but um, I don't see any other choices than those three. And unfortunately, the Israeli government under Netanyahu has refused to go for the Palestinian Authority option, um, uh, has basically chosen not to govern it, so seems to be by default opting for the Somali option, 
But at the end of the day, it may end up with actually the Hamas option. Who uh, has an incentive to keep it going the way it's going right now? It's a very good question. And I think um, uh, two people, um, Lawrence, have been codependent basically from uh, long before the beginning of this war, and that's Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar. They, they feed off each other. Um, and uh, the threat of Sinwar, uh, 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 Netanyahu has always leveraged uh, you know, to win his elections. And at the same time, um, Netanyahu's willingness to sort of feed uh, Sinwar and Hamas in Gaza as an alternative to the West Bank has helped uh, Sinwar. So um, the two of them uh, have a real interest in the war going on now. Sinwar smells that the world has turned against Israel, uh, even the United States, and therefore he's going to drag out these negotiations for a ceasefire and the uh, important hostage release, uh, as your earlier video showed, I think as long as he can to strike the strongest bargain he can. And, and Netanyahu uh, knows that he'd like to always be winning in, in Gaza, Lawrence, but not win. Because the minute the war is over, there will be a real reckoning uh, between Netanyahu and the Israeli people. What do you see as President Biden's best options in a world of no good options, it seems, at this point? Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, you know, President Biden, I, I think his heart has been very much in the right place. He, he understood this was a, a murderous attack on Israel, that there is no two-state solution with Hamas. Um, and at the same time, he probably was um, uh, he was too tolerant of an Israeli strategy um, that was willing to sacrifice far too many Palestinian civilians in order to achieve its military objectives. But I don't think this story is over at all or over at all for President Biden. I know the administration is preparing a peace initiative, uh, something very big that would involve both Saudi Arabia and um, Hamas, what uh, Israeli peace process expert Giddy Greenstein calls more for more. You know, a, a much bigger uh, uh, security benefit package for Israel from the whole Arab world and much bigger opportunity um, uh, for the Palestinians uh, for two states. And so I think that is what will be the next move if, Lawrence, we can get to a ceasefire and a hostage release. I think the, the administration will then use that moment, that opening, to come in with something very big and hopefully uh, create a situation where the war would not resume. Might we be at a point uh, in the calendar and in the political calendar where uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is looking at the presidential election here and picking uh, which one of these candidates uh, would be better for him in the White House for the next four years? Uh, it's a good question. And I think he is so focused on his own political survival, uh, which is deeply in doubt, that um, uh, you know, thinking he can kind of uh, play the game of American politics, I think, is would be naive. And I think it's unlikely because Donald Trump is not some big Netanyahu fan either. And um, Trump has been telling Netanyahu, hey, round, the, you know, end this thing quickly. You're, you're getting killed uh, in terms of PR on the world stage. So the idea that Trump would somehow be good for Netanyahu, I'm not sure that's true. Thomas Friedman, thank you very much for joining us. We always appreciate whenever you can give us the time. Thanks, Lawrence. Always good to be with you. Thank you. We'll be right back. Tom Friedman gets tonight's last word. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.